Man, I am thankful to be in church. It's amazing at times we can maybe forget about or not know what really the church is up to and what's going on in the church. And if you're not plugged into a Bible study or to a retreat or serving in some way, um, it's hard to know what all's happening. Um, I, I want to share some stuff with you this morning. Um, it's a time really for us of celebration. You, you think about the world and the condition that it's in. I just really have so much to say this morning, and I have a small amount of time to say it. You think about what we see on the news and read and all the stuff, but yet God is moving and changing people's lives constantly, if not more so now than ever before. Um, we just saw the men's, a little men's recap and women's reca recap. The women at their retreat had two salvations. Uh, where there were 11 women that were baptized. The man camp, there were four uh, first-time salvations. 11 men were baptized. Uh, student ministry, which happened two weeks ago, our, our uh, student camp, wired camp, uh, we had eight first-time salvations. And we just finished preteen camp Saturday, and out of, we had 40 at student camp, 45, 52 at student camp, and 44 or 45 at um, preteen, and we had 18 salvations at preteen, eight. So 26 young people came to know Jesus in the last two weeks. Yeah. And, you know, I have to say to you that if we're not seeing baptisms, if we're not seeing salvations, we're not seeing the effects of the gospel. The gospel is the effect that causes this. I want to be a part of something that's alive and not dead. Amen. I don't want to be operating in fear. I want to be operating in faith and know that God is still sovereign He's still on the throne. You hear that all the time. But the fact of the matter is, do we live that out? We're going to talk about that here in just a bit because we're talking about being a light. Um, we have workers who take vacation, volunteers that take vacation to go and serve students and, and kids. We just take their time off just to serve and what happens is they really get blessed too. We saw lots of tears shed and some amazing things happen. So, man, I'm just so thankful for everyone that makes the difference uh, in the kingdom and what's, what God's doing in them. Um, if you're here for the very first time, good morning. We're glad that you're here. Uh, if you're here, we want to recognize you. If you would, raise your hand. We actually have a card for you to fill out. Anyone here this morning, first time? Anyone? No? Okay, just the family. Yes, right here. Very good. Uh, we'll just give you a card. Thank you for being here. Um, and if you'll fill it out and take it here to the information booth, we have a gift for you, and we'd love for you to uh, receive that. Um, also, communion. We moved communion uh, from last Sunday uh, to this Sunday. So you, did you have everybody, if you got your elements, make sure you have your elements. If you don't have elements, raise your hand, and we'll get them to you. I know there's quite a number of them right there. Here, here you go. Here you go, Taya. Um, yep, yeah, let's make sure everyone has it. As we um, prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper, my heart is prepared. We at this church do open communion. That means that if you've asked Jesus to be your Lord and Savior and you're a Christian, then you can celebrate the Lord's Supper with us. It is a celebration. Oftentimes we take communion in this somber way, and that's fine, that's good. The fact of the matter is without the shed blood of Christ, this is not possible. So... He paid mine and your price, so that could cause us to be somber, but he did what his father asked him to do. He said, Lord, your will, not mine. A king that came to serve and not to be served. 
And still today, people just can't understand this servant king, Jesus. It's completely against really the way we operate. We see someone that has the kingdom and has the, the cars and the clothes and the, the crowns and all the stuff, and Jesus is like, mm, here are my treasure, the people. Just a whole different world. And so when we take communion, and this is the last supper Jesus had with his disciples, What he was telling them and showing them, they just quite didn't understand. That by what's happening, the body and the blood is what is the New Testament. It's the new covenant. This is the new covenant in the blood. This is where freedom for us, prior to this, there was no way for us to be free. We are free now. And you're going to hear that, uh, that throughout this entire year, all the way up to retreat time, that we are free people, no longer in bondage, but free. And we're going to teach every way that we can so that you can grasp the freedom that you have. Matter of fact, next year's retreats are already called Freedom, the men and women's retreats. And so it's just important for us as an attitude that the Lord Jesus uh, this provided our freedom. This, he said, I came to set the captives free. We do have this new covenant. We're now under grace, and it's, we're saved by grace. And what a beautiful picture that it is. This represents the body of Jesus that's broken for each person in this room. Those who hate him and those who love him. It's broken for everyone. The Lord's deal is that no one, none would perish. He doesn't want anyone to perish, even though some will. The body of the, of the Lord. So after supper, he took the bread, broke it, and said, do this in remembrance of me. Take the body. And as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. If you would, take the, take the cup, the juice. Praise you, Jesus. Lord, this morning we, um, we want to say thank you. We have a grateful heart. We have gratitude to you, God. Uh, really, there's words for me. I can't express my thankfulness of what you have provided. You paid Robert's debt that was owed. I couldn't, I couldn't pay. But you paid it for the past, present, and future sins. The perfect sacrifice. The Lamb of God. So God, today we just love you. We thank you. We thank you for what you're doing, what we're getting to see you do in our, our church, in our community. Uh, we are so grateful uh, Lord, for all the many blessings that you have for us. And God, we don't take it lightly, the responsibility that comes with that. So we're forever grateful, and we love you, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> to be a light in the world is what we're going to talk about. Uh, the Lord spoke to me this morning as I was just sitting here talking uh, to some of the leaders here uh, before church, and... Um, It just came out of my mouth that if you can't love yourself, you're going to struggle loving others. And we're talking about being the light of the world. We're still in the Sermon on the Mount, and it's no surprise that Jesus, the Word of God, which we find in John 1.1, 1, 1, was a dynamic speaker. This is a message that he gave. Of all of the recorded messages, the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus taught the true standard of Christianity. Being my followers and my disciples, this is what you look like. Or this is what you will look like when you follow me. Either way, however you want to look at it. Throughout the sermon, Jesus used various methods to make his message clear to his audience. And this audience still includes me and you today. 
One of the images that Jesus verbally painted for us is in Matthew 5, 14. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill can, cannot be hidden, nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that you may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. What does this series of statements mean for me and you today? The context of the light of the world passage, after going through the list known as the Beatitudes, Jesus refers to the salt and the light. We've talked about salt. We've covered salt in great detail. It's not over only to flavor things, but in that culture at that time, it was to preserve things. And so what I submitted to you for us today is salt is us. We are to preserve. We're preserving the gospel message that is the salt. The good news is going to always be the good news. Matthew 5.13 is a quick uh, recap. You're the salt of the earth, but if its salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's good for nothing to be thrown out, trampled underfoot by men. The reference to light comes right after the final beatitude, which promises a reward for when, if not, for when we are persecuted. Even when persecution affects, uh, affects the followers of Christ, we're not to lose our salt and our light, nor can you. There is a responsibility of being light. Here's what I want to submit to you this morning is this, that with every blessing, there comes a level of responsibility. See, oftentimes we want the blessing, but we don't want the responsibility. I can give you an example. Think about something new that you've wanted or an additional thing that you've wanted. I don't know, I've got friends that's got many tractors and many pieces of equipment, and there's always maintenance, there's always stuff, and it just eats away time. You may have one horse, but how, how, what does it take to take care of two or four? You may have one cow, what does it take to take care of a hundred head of cattle? The more you have, the more the responsibility. When we, when we are saved, it, it, we have a responsibility, that blessing of salvation, now we have a responsibility to go and make disciples. Amen. That is the way we can let our light shine and to be the preservation or the flavor of the world. But oftentimes we want that salvation, but we, want, we are constantly challenged by this. I don't know enough scripture to go out and be a light. I don't know how to pray like that person prays. I don't, I, I don't know, I haven't served enough. I, oftentimes what's causing the, this stuff to stop from happening is the lack of, of love of ourself. See, I think once we could start seeing ourselves as Jesus sees us, we would have the boldness to go to others and express love. Amen. So here's the problem with it. The problem is if you don't love yourself, you're blocked. And when you do go to talk to somebody, you have little to no confidence in what you're actually telling them because you're going, well, I don't feel loved. But Jesus says, love me with all your heart, mind, body, and soul and love your neighbor as yourself. Well, Robert, you don't know what I've done in my life. I don't care what you've done. It doesn't matter. There's no caveat in here. Asterisk, see, ask, see what Robert Stokes has done. Where's his resume? doesn't say that. Okay, that's free. Um, the responsibility of being a light, the description of light of the world conveys a responsibility that Christ places on the shoulders of his followers. I want to talk to you briefly about the yoke, okay? Uh, you know about yokes? I don't know. And I'm not talking about the yellow thing that's inside of an egg. What I'm talking about is the wooden yoke that you put on oxen to work them. It says, don't get around people who are, or don't attach yourself or even marry somebody unequally yoked. Well, if you can imagine for a second, you have two animals tied together and, and one is lazy and one pulls. You're gonna be very inefficient. You're not gonna get much done. It's a simple, simple explanation. You're not gonna get much done. Here's the reason. Because not only is the one puller trying to pull the implement but they're trying to pull the one that's not pulling along with them. And it's constant tension. When you're yoked with Jesus, he's always going to be pulling. 
He's always gonna be doing what he needs to do to make things work, always. Hmm. No, I'm going to wait on that. Mm -hmm. And and yes, I am. Philippians 2.15. In a world full of evil and spiritual darkness, um, this becomes increasingly vital responsibility for his people to be the light. That you may become blameless and harmless children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation among whom you shine as lights in the world. Being labeled as light of the world isn't just a fancy or nice title. It's not a nice sounding phrase. It is to be a description that affects every aspect of how we live our lives. See, oftentimes people, uh, they don't understand that you can live an incredible Christian life Uh, I thought that you, in order to cook crawfish and eat crawfish, you had to drink the whole time. Or you had to barbecue, you had to drink the whole time. Or if you go fishing or hunting, you had to drink the whole time. Or go to the bar or do whatever. I know I'm talking to certain people in here. I lived that way. I didn't know that you couldn't have fun without it being a party. I didn't know that you could have a party and not have to do other stuff. I had no idea that you could do that. I'm like, that's boring. It's not boring. As a matter of fact, it's wonderful. There's like nothing like it, as a matter of fact. And actually, you remember what happened the next morning, which is really amazing. It's like, <laughs> I, don't, I never was wanting to say, well, you man, you should have, you remember what you did? Mm, no. That's not things that you want to hear, okay? Walk in the light. Ephesians 5, 8, for you were once in darkness, but now you are the light of the world. Walk as children of light. We, have, we are to have nothing to do with the darkness that dwells in the surrounding world. It's to be in the world, but not of the world. 1 Thessalonians 5, 5, you are all sons of light, sons of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Our light has to shine brightly. And I'm just going to ask you, do you love yourself? Your light will not shine. You will not let people see you if you don't love yourself. People that don't love themselves are people who are hiding things generally. And here's always, I'm going to continue to say this. You fall in love with people based on what you don't know. Then once you know us, we're hard to love often. No amens. Okay, Uh, there's a lot of married people here sitting next to their spouses, so that was probably the wrong place to ask for one. Our lights got to shine brightly. We see in in the references a city on a hill. We see a a light like a city on a hill. This This scripture is being used and these words are being used for a reason. Matthew 5, 14. You're a light in the world, a city that's set on a hill can't be hidden. It's a metaphorical description of a city, and here's the thing I want to say to you, in the day, back in the day, from a defensive standpoint, during the day, they didn't have night vision and all this other stuff. When you fought, often you fought during the day where you could see what was going on, the best defense was to be up high and have them coming up. Well, in, at nighttime, you can't hide that. What worked during the day at night, now you're, now you're vulnerable. Now you can be seen very easily. There's no way around it. And that day, that was okay. This day, they turn the lights out at night if they feel like something's going to bomb them. Our, our deal is this. Wherever we are, we are the light. You and I are a city on a hill. You see the, see the deal? We can't be hidden. It even goes, who throws a a cover over or a blanket over? No one does that. No one does that, or do they? We find often that Christians will camouflage themselves. We look like Christians here. We may worship and show up at a Bible study, but in the world, you can't tell us apart from anyone else. That is where our light is not being able to flow to others. Hmm. Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 7 It says, therefore, be careful to observe them, for this is your wisdom and your understanding in sight of the peoples who will hear all of these statutes and say, Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 7, I know I'm moving a little quick, 
and say, surely this great nation is wise and understanding, has an understanding people. For what great nation is there that has God so near to it as the Lord our God is to us for whatever reason he may call upon them? I'm giving you that scripture for a reason because Israel, the light, the Jewish people to reflect the light of Christ, they, they failed in their responsibility to be the light. It failed. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 11. I hope you're making notes. I hope, you, I hope you're making notes in your Bible. I'm, I'm telling you, the scriptures that I'm giving you will help you understand what's going on and how to keep from, keep from your light being hidden. It's oftentimes, you know, we're in a country that's doing everything it can to remove its history. I don't know if you know, knew that or not. They're removing, they're removing history everywhere. Whether you agree or disagree, it doesn't matter. History's being changed. Here's the thing about history. We're to learn from it, not to remove it. But see, they're trying to do the same thing with the word of God, trying to remove it. Listen to this. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses, into the cloud and into the sea, all ate the same spiritual food, all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. You're here, you're, this is the Exodus. This is the Israelites coming out of uh, Israel, I mean, out of Egypt. A uh, spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But most of them, God was not well pleased with, for their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now these came, uh, these, now these things be, uh, became our examples to the intent that we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted, and do not become idolaters as some of them did, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. Nor let us commit sexual immorality as some of them did, and in one day 23,000 fell. Nor let us tempt Christ as some of them are also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. Nor complain as some of them also complained and were destroyed by the destroyer. Now all these things happened to them as... Is there any other word in your Bible that would describe that word? Or does your Bible say examples? Any different word? Anybody? And they were written for our admon admon admonition upon whom the ends of the age have come. As spiritual Israel, follow, Israel followers of Jesus are not to fail. We're not to fail. Instead, our light has to shine brightly and show people the ways of the Lord. Our light should affect those around us. You hear me talk all the time about influence. What are you influencing? Did you know that light influences darkness? We live in a dark world. Why? The lack of light. We have people that come to church, they hear a message, and they go and live just like everyone else lives. Our light has to affect those around us. So wonderful to see uh, our children's and student uh, volunteers and workers. They are affecting lives. They are the light. These people that are in these rooms, they are the salt and light to these children. They are taking and, and pouring themselves into these kids. Your kids, my kids, grandkids. It's making a difference. Hmm. Our light has to affect those around us. I've got a, before I finish up this morning, I've got something I want to talk to you about. I want to talk to you about a specific person in the scriptures and maybe you could relate. We're talking about letting your light shine. Let's talk about Peter. Let's use Peter as an example. Maybe you're a Peter or you know a Peter. Peter. 
Peter said that our example should be such that those we encounter may by our good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. That's 1 Peter 2.12, or as part of 1 Peter 2.12. It says, having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God, not you, in the day of visitation. It says, nor do you put a light on a lampstand and put it under a, a, a basket. But a lampstand gives light to those in the house. The apostle Peter was one of Jesus' closest friends. He was present during all the ministry that we see. I want to take you on a, just a quick little journey as we finish up this morning. Mark 14, 66 through 72. Maybe the old story will ring, a, 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 have a little remembrance of a story you've heard. Now, as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked at him and said, you also were with Jesus of Nazareth. But he denied it, saying, I neither know nor understand what you're saying. And he went out on the porch, and a rooster crowed. And the servant girl saw him again and began to say to those who stood by, this is the one of them, but he denied it again. And a little later, who stood by, said to Peter again, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean, and your speech shows it. Then he began to curse and swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. A second time the rooster crowed. Then Peter called to mind the word that Jesus had said to him, Before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And when he thought about it, he wept. You know what's happening here, right? He's a follower until the pressure came. See, I think that's the problem we have also. See, one of the things that Peter lacked was confidence. He was really being carried by Jesus. He, was, he didn't realize the amount of stuff that was going into him. He didn't understand his responsibility. And when the pressure came, things changed. God doesn't give us the light for us to hide it. See, now, in many ways, in many ways, I feel like that um, we'll say the right things but do the wrong things. And I want you to remember something. 93% of communication is nonverbal. I'm a Christian, but what does that mean? What does that look like? Or looks like that it looks like you're light and that you're salt and that do you have to focus on being light and salt? No, you just have to focus on having this freedom that Christ provides to you. So my question for you before we go into worship, if the band would come, is there any Peter in any of us? Are you struggling with loving yourself? Are you still struggling with what your identity in Christ is? And that by when you hear us talk about surrendering and things like that, as a man or a woman, does that somehow offend you or cause that pride to rile up? I don't wanna ever be seen as weak. Well, it has nothing to do with being weak. It has everything to do with being strong. The weak won't inherit the earth. The meek will. Those who are teachable. So my question to you as we enter worship is, is there any Peter in you? And when people see you, what do they see? Do they see Jesus? Do they see that reflection Lord, as we uh, prepare to worship you, God, my, my prayer is this, that we would um, hear from you, each one of us, that we would take time even before we get down on our knees at the altar, uh, raise our hands maybe for the first time, just finding a way of surrendering and allowing these things to fall away. God, I would pray 
uh, and praying to you now, and I petition you, Lord, move this morning in this, Holy Spirit, move this morning in this church, and that there's lights would start to be brighter and would shine brighter, and God, people would start to appreciate you more, love you more, love themselves more, love others more. God, your word says that love never fails. It covers a multitude of sin. God, we thank you for being our light and showing us the way. We're forever grateful. We love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.